And welcome to the Rob Call Bottom Up Show, available on Pacifica Radio and Progressive Radio Networks, and iTunes and Stitcher and SoundCloud. And the complete uh, archive of the shows are is available at slash podcasts My guest for this show is Four Arrows, uh, otherwise known as Don Jacobs, otherwise known as Wahink Pe Topa. So uh, this interview will explore the Native American wisdom of Sitting Bull based on the book, Sitting Bull's Words for a World in Crisis. Uh, now, you've been a guest on my show a, a bunch of times, and so it's great to have you back. It's always good to, to be interviewed with you and have our dialogue. So let me tell the, the listeners and the viewers a little bit about you. You're a former director of education at Oglala Lakota College, and you're currently a professor at Fielding Graduate University. He's the author of 22 books that have received praise from such authors as Vandana Shiva, Noam Chomsky, Tom Hartman, Hartman John Pilger, Vine Deloria Jr., Greg Kehete, and many others. His book, Teaching Truly, a Curriculum to Indigenize Mainstream Education, was selected by the Chicago Wisdom Project as one of the top progressive education books, along with Paulo Freire, Neil Postman, and John Dewey's books. His website is fourarrowsbooks.com. All right. So, Sitting Bull's words for a world in crisis. What's your goal for this book? Well, there's no doubt our world is in an existential condition as was Sitting Bull's world in the 1800s, 1830 to 1890 was his lifespan. And uh, over and over, I've been asked, uh, do I feel that my work in putting forth uh, the two concepts I put forth, one is indigenous place-based knowledge about which I know very little. You have to be able to speak a language fluently, be raised in a specific place uh, with, a trad with traditional parents, which are fewer and fewer with the missionization of Indian people all throughout the United States and around the world. So I, 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 that's one of the things that I do is I try to promote the support for indigenous sovereignty. But what my specialty is, is what are the common tenets, the beliefs, the worldview of all those great variety of indigenous cultures that are distinctly different from the worldview of the great variety of cultures under what we might call the dominant worldview. Um, and more and more scholars over the last decade have entered into worldview conversations where they start out with saying a worldview oh, it can be a belief, a culture, a, a religion, a philosophy, you know, there's millions of them, right? Which waters down the original, even the original European, Weltanschauung. Uh, but, uh, and, and, and worldview is a bad word to describe an indigenous worldview because we don't really visualize the world, we sense it. But it still is, over time, uh, Robert Redfield, the social, father of social anthropology from the University of Chicago, in the 30s, he began to talk about worldview in a very important way and, and said there's really only three essential ones. There's the one from the East, the one from the West, and the one he called the primitive one. Uh, by the 50s, he and his group from Chicago had essentially said, no, nah, there's really not only two now. The East has been essentially overtaken from a worldview perspective by the West. What's and, a worldview? Yeah. So a worldview is the basic understanding of our position, our reason for being in the universe, and what our basic assumptions are about our purpose here and about why we exist. Okay. Okay. Right? So for example, a difference, almost all of the agencies, cultures, schools, organizations under the dominant worldview have a human-centered, anthropocentric approach and understanding. 
Certainly there are people that are isolated with different views, but essentially they still support systems that are largely anthropocentric. And all of the indigenous cultures with their great diversity, underneath the different beliefs lies this worldview that goes, well, no, <laughs> you know, if anything, animals are, and, and birds and insects and trees are our teachers. That was on cue, right? <laughs> the barking. <laughs> Let me see if I can slow that down. Okay, we just had someone come over to the house and she, she's doing her duty, right? Doing her duty. We lost your video yes. though. There you go. Okay, so um, yeah, so, so th those are the kinds of distinctions. We can look at uh, spirituality in terms of animism, uh, you know, versus materialism as, as these fundamental priorities. Um, you can, you know, and, in the, and, and so I knew that, the, that Sitting Bull was a great advocate of the worldview precepts of indigenous peoples. And I believe deeply that the crisis that we're in, in the world in crisis, from the pandemic to climate change, is a result of misguided worldview that we lost probably around 9,000 years ago, which is really only 1% of human history, if we believe that human history goes back about a million and a half years. Um, and so, over that time, uh, our world, our new worldview that developed, that was uh, alienated from nature, afraid of nature, or saw nature only as a resource for the sake of human beings. Once that process began, and it, of course it accelerated about you know two thousand years ago, and then with the industrial age, it got more and more. I believe that it can track our killing of nature and the suffering of mother earth that has put us in an existential crisis. So I thought Sitting Bull's words, he, cause he lived in a similar crisis in the 1800s in that all the Buffalo uh, with his source of sustenance were killed essentially. The smallpox had wiped out many of his people. And yet he continued to live according to the many worldview precepts that, you know, I can, we can talk about our list. There's 40 of them and I used about 28 for the book. Um, and I thought if I could find a quote for maybe, you know, a good percentage of these worldview precepts from him and then use that as a representation uh, to move into how we can do worldview reflection and begin to move away from that a worldview that is harmful into the one that belongs to all of us, whether we're indigenous or not, that allowed us to live on this planet in relative peace and harmony for most of human history. Now you meant, you threw in a word that I'd never heard before, the missionization of indigenous people. And uh, I know what it is. I'd like you to talk about what, actually, what that is, what it means and what was done. Well, of course, the, if we look at the American experience of colonization, we know that it was the Catholic Church and the papal bulls that authorized uh, the conquests and the conquistadors and Columbus, starting with that, uh, to uh, have any land that they wanted, to take any women that they wanted and rape them, to uh, kill anyone that they needed to who were not baptized. Um, and so this, this was, you know, essentially the foundation for the rationalization of taking land and gold and, and whatnot. Um, eventually, of course, missionaries, uh, many good-hearted, uh, tried to uh, Christianize uh, indigenous peoples, and that process has not stopped. I don't have... Uh, hard statistics, but I would reckon that over 60% of American Indians in the United States today uh, will claim that they are, are Christians. And 
and maybe a larger percentage. Certainly, I would say that that would be a minimum. And many uh, uh, who are still uh, holding on to their tribal religion and, and worldview, uh, is really, I shouldn't say religion, spiritual tradition, because uh, we really don't have religions per se. Um, I, I would say that they have forgotten many of the traditions. I know like the Navajo who I work with, uh, I would say that the majority of their ceremonies have been forgotten. And that uh, again, over 60% of the, of, the of the people are uh, you know, living according to Christianity. Now I'm not putting down any of the, of the religions. If we go to the founders of all the great religions, I think they were trying to get us back into the balance that had been lost. But then political influences came about and religions changed. And so certainly we can look at scripture in the Quran or in the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the, the Bible, Old or New Testament, um, and in the, in the, in the Torah, etc. And we will see the anthropocentrism perspective, for, you know, and, and, and so um, the, mission, the missionary work, you know, has money behind it. Uh, you know, uh, I, I know I, I just had a, a student uh, who got a, a doctorate um, and was telling me that the president of uh, the Navajo Nation in good faith sent a group of people taking uh, money from some of the missions to go to Israel to, to learn information about how to farm and bring that back to the Navajo reservation. And of course, he said that with, with some pain and, and frustration and criticism, because instead of asking the elders who still remember how to do it, you know, th there was this process that, that occurred, you know. So that's part of the missionization uh, you know, process. On my reservation in Pine Ridge, uh, you know, some of the best schools are missionary schools. And they try to teach, uh, you know, some good things about the history. But, you know, uh, you know, they're, you know, if you look at Robert Warrior's work, for example, who says, you, it, it's impossible to blend the two religions, uh, uh, you know, with indigenous spirituality because they say this is the only path. Uh, and, uh, um, and, you know, and with the history, all that, it's, 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 it's a challenge. So, you know, that's what I mean by that mission. But you're leaving, you're leaving out a piece of it though. I mean, mm -hmm. another piece of it is that they kidnapped children, took them away from their parents and with the intention of keeping them away permanently so that they would literally destroy all of the cultural connection that the children had to the parents. This was an intentional kidnapping, basically. It happened in the US, it happened in Canada, it, it happened in Australia, and I don't know where else. But it, it, it's a horrific thing. Uh, I actually knew somebody who went through it. And uh, well, I know a lot, of, a lot of people who have went through it. And, yeah. and I was talking about current mission, missionization uh, when you asked me, that's how I usually think of the word. The, the Canadian uh, Truth and Reconciliation Report is probably the best document on what you're talking about. Uh, you know, and it had the, the Canadian government had to be sued for that document to come forth. But in the summary, in the executive summary, they refer to the boarding school phenomenon, which is how I think of it. Uh, that was run by uh, the you know religions as as genocide. I mean, they don't pull any punches on the word. And in fact, twenty four percent of children who are taken away from their parents and forced into these boarding schools up until nineteen seventy, twenty four percent died of abuse. And I always compare that to twenty five percent. I'm sorry, vice versa, it was 25%. And I compare that to the 24% of Canadian soldiers who died in World War II. In other words, more children died in boarding schools than Canadian soldiers died in World War II. So when we're talking about worldview, we're talking about a worldview that was intentionally forced on children with the intention of totally destroying 
any connection they had to their roots, to the indigenous nature oriented worldview that they were being raised in or that they were born into. Exactly. So, for example, if we look at the table of context, to context of Sitting Bull, I'll just name seven, the 17 uh, things that were taken away from those children. And you can just, the, the, the listener can go, well, wait a minute, no wonder, right? No wonder we're in this little mess. They took away truthfulness, okay? Because we know that the use of words for deceit are, have been come and have been for a long time uh, uh, part of the, the indigenous uh, or the dominant worldview. Uh, Fear-based. Uh, we, I'll just I'll just read them as the as the contents go. We 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 uh, untruthfulness to truthfulness uh, is the negative to the positive or the dominant to the indigenous. Fear-based to fearlessness-based. Hierarchical to non-hierarchical anthropocentric to non-anthropocentric, low respect for women, which is obvious throughout all of the, even in the scriptures, uh, to high respect for women, fragmented learning to holistic learning, non-spiritual to spiritual, low regard for, uh, for uh, ceremony and trance state learning and high regard, emphasis on rights versus an emphasis on responsibility, Competition for the sake of winning versus competition for positive potentiality. Dual, dualistic thinking uh, compared to non-dualistic thinking. Detachment compared to empathy. Materialistic versus non-materialistic. Low social purpose to high social purpose. Limited in intimacy to high intimacy. Relatively low personal vitality to high personal vitality talk about the health and vitality of indigenous people. You know, there, there were people that went AWOL from, you know, the Calvary because of their, of the sanitation and the health and the vitality. And, and so, you know, it's like the, the, the criticism that is levied when I give these, these polarities is that this dualistic thinking, right? Well, one of the precepts in indigenous world, I just read 17 of the 40, is complementarity, seeking complementarity. Well, the indigenous worldview does that, um, whereas that isn't in the, you know, the competitiveness in Darwin's idea of survival of the fittest. What do you mean by complementarity? Complementarity is in, in apparent opposites, seeing that there are symbiotic relationships. Okay, so being able to see a, an argument, a competitor, a, a, a tree, whatever, as not an opposite, but as something in which you have something in common that you can share in a way that helps, helps one another, right? And so that's part, that's an indigenous worldview. But when I read these, these, two, off, these two options here, uh, the, and, and you know, the, the defining uh, the indigenous vers versus the, the dominant worldview, we're talking about coming to a cross in the roads and making a choice between two ways, two ways of being, one of which has probable benefits and the other one which has probable deficits right but but it's really not a choice for most people i mean it's really they go through western culture they grow up in it they're exposed to television they go through western education and unless they're highly wealthy and go to some kind of a special school where they get special attention they're going to be processed to, in, in an education system that is designed to turn them into obedient workers and soldiers who embrace the way of seeing the world that is this dominant, anthropocentric, disconnected one. Because I, I really think, you know, I, I, read a, I came up with this concept in my book, Bottom Up Revolution of Connection Consciousness, Bottom Up Connection Consciousness. And I really think that's one of the key elements that you're describing in the indigenous world is being aware of how we're all connected together to each other and to nature. Exactly. I mean, that's the prayer when we go into a lodge. We say metakoyayasi, which means we're all connected. It is that interconnectedness that is the core facet of spirituality. Spirituality in an in indigenous worldview means 
recognition that we're all connected and giving significance to others. So your 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 book is capturing that as 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 and and, and the only exception that I would say in your question that you want to that I would like to clarify is when you said uh, except for wealthy people going to wealthy schools. In essence, that would be worse probably. In other words, that pr the promotion of of the dominant worldview is probably more prolific because of the materialistic qualities. If you look at the, 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 you know, the Republican Party, Noam Chomsky says is the most dangerous organization in the world under Trump and maybe continuing. We know that the representation is about materialism. It's about wealth, it's about money. So the more moneyed, the, the more of a tendency to gravitate towards patriarchy, towards all these, these dominant worldviews. People in poverty living on the river probably have more respect for women. They probably have more respect for the water. And so, so, so I wouldn't make that exception, right? Uh, well, the reason, but, I, the reason but generally you're, you're right. Yeah, the education is problem is, is missing. The reason I said it is wealthy kids go to private schools where they get exposed to a broader range than if they're going to public schools. And but not, but not they don't get exposed to this, you know, and, and, and but nobody does. Yeah, yeah. And so, so they don't nobody gets exposed to it, but some people push it harder. Right. And so so I was almost the, almost the inverse. But but that's why the solution. That's why. I wrote the, the, the book that the Chicago Wisdom Project selected as one of the top uh, progressive books of, you know, I, now I was embarrassed to see, you know, <laughs> no, you know, all the, all the, the people that I, I, I learned from, you know, uh, John Dewey and, 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 and Paul Freire. But that book was about indigenizing mainstream education, right. of having not Teaching yeah, not, yeah, teaching truly a curriculum to indigenize mainstream education. What I do in that book is I take all the subject areas and then I look at the common core standards that are requirements for it. And I show how each subject area is taught in a hegemonic way. Hegemonic meaning a way that the status quo ruling elite wants you to believe. So for example, in health education, 70% of all curriculum is about how to access the medical profession. It's not about preventive medicine, right? On and on and on, right? And so first I show how, how it's hegemonic, colonized, uh, and dominant worldview oriented. And then I show if it were taught from an indigenous perspective, how would it look? Well, first of all, it wouldn't be fragmented into different courses. All the courses would be combined holistically, but then I go into that, right? So it's possible to teach. Now, Indian country is divided on whether that should happen or not. Half of my brothers and sisters say, no, no, if you don't, if you're not indigenous, you can't teach this. Then I get back into, well, wait a minute. I know a lot of non-Indian people who are more indigenous than a lot of indigenous people based on what we were just talking about with, with missionization. So, but I've got friends that quote, uh, Fool's Crow, for example, who says, no, no one owns this worldview. This belongs to the earth and of all people on it, all creatures on it, you know. So, but I do understand that other position because of misappropriation. Uh, uh, people have taken, you know, everything away uh, and now they're trying to take away the, the spirituality. And, 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 and I agree to a degree that education is probably, you know, a very difficult place for it to happen. You know, I think, uh, you know, you've seen my, my quote on my email that says, you know, in ed, higher education is not a place of enlightenment. It's a place where you come in and steal, you know, what you can, right? So, but it's what we got. And so I, my work is to try to get educators to bring forth the cat fawn connection, which is what in Sitting Bull I use uh, that came to me as a vision, as a vehicle, a tool to dehypnotize ourselves and to re-embrace the worldview. Okay, so we're gonna talk about cat fawn and we're gonna talk about the hypnosis of colonialism after a brief break for sh the show ID.
And my guest for this show is Wahinkpe Topa, also known as Four Arrows, also known as Don Trent Jacobs. He is the former director of education at Oglala Lakota College and currently a professor at Fielding Graduate University, the author of 22 books. And his, one of his latest is Sitting Bull's Words for a World in Crisis, which we're talking about. So hypnosis of colonialism and cat fawn. Talk about them. Well, I, I taught hypnosis at UC Berkeley uh, for people wanting to get who were MFCCs, marriage, family, child counselors, who wanted to get certified so they could use hypnotherapy in their practice. Uh, and as a student of hypnosis, I was also at the same time training wild mustangs for the Bureau of Land Management. And I made a connection uh, that I won't go into, but you can go on YouTube and put in wild horse hypnotists and actually see a demonstration uh, that hypnosis is a naturalistic phenomenon for all of us. It doesn't require uh, somebody inducing hypnosis that is, is, you know, has to be certified. We use it all the time. It's just believing in an image when you are in an alternative brainwave frequency that used, could be alpha or lower. And, and, and we, we use it continually. In fact, during the first five years of our life, we're pretty much in a state of hypnosis all the time. That's why we can learn 10 languages if we're growing up in a family like that. But we can also learn something from a teacher who walks up to us and says, Rob, you can't do that arithmetic problem with two plus two still, you're never going to amount to anything. And that hypnotic suggestion is a hypnotic suggestion because that person is in a state of hypnosis. And in fact, I believe that all creatures become hypersuggestible to the communication of a perceived trusted authority figure. And, and, and that can explain why we are poisoning our water and our air. How else can you explain what we do? It's not logical. You can get, it doesn't take much education to say you don't put affluent from your corporation into, you know, the Cuyahoga River. It doesn't take much. In other words, it's got to be that we are hip, like just what you said, Rob, that we are hypnotized by the ways the worldview has been presented to us in schools and media and everything. And, and we just, and then of course it's promoted by the hegemons, the people who have the ruling elite power and make money from it, right? That's, that, that, that continues. That's why Indian uh, protesters are so, so attacked and feared because of a worldview that doesn't even believe in property ownership, let alone a lot of the other things of the, of the American dream. So that's what I mean by the hypnosis. Now, you know, another perspective that has, I've, I've had on my show is George Lakoff. He wrote the book, Don't Think of an Elephant and the Idea of Cognitive Framing. And that's also done on the, the, the right political side as well, the idea of framing. And, and what I realize is that when you're brought up in this dominant anthropocentric culture, it totally affects the, the way that you frame your experience, the way you frame your relationships <coughs> with people, with nature. And so uh, one more piece, you talk about hypnosis. Uh, I, I've done a lot of work with the world of story. I ran a conference once story, the first one that brought together all the different worlds of story. And, and one of the things I learned is that when you tell a good story, you create a story trance, a hypnotic trance. So if, 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 you're, if you've made a good movie or a good novel, people are gonna stay up to all hours reading that book or, or, they're going to, or watching the movie if it's on Netflix because they're, they've been induced into a story trance. And good, good point. And so really, the, our two cultures, the indigenous culture and the Western culture, they both, both produced a profoundly deep state of trance, really, that you're challenging the readers of Sitting Bull's words for a world in crisis to, chat, to break out of, really. 
or, or yeah, you said that beautifully, or to break out of or to come into in this way. Because even George Lakoff, you know, he, 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 he writes that um, we need to learn how to visualize. He talks, he's got a quote where he says, uh, 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 metaphors are important because they mediate the interface between consciousness and, and, and unconsciousness, right? And what you're saying is, is very, very similar. The difference is, what I'm trying to do with Cat Fawn is to put, because it is a phenomenon that's natural, the trance is. The problem is, is that we've lost control of it. We've given control of it, right? So, so you're right on. And when we just tell stories, people are in trance. But if the stories are promoting materialism and money or uh, anti-women or violence or guns, we're, we're hypnotized into that. If the video games are doing it, we're hypnotized into that. If the teachers, you know, so what we've got to do is realize, wait a minute, I don't need to pay someone $300 an hour to hypnotize me to stop smoking. I got to just go into a, a, a brainwave frequency that makes my brain synapses respond to believing in an image. Because that's really the simplest way to describe hypnosis. So now when you're talking about brainwave frequency, you're, you said alpha or lower. And when it comes to brainwaves, if you go above alpha, you're basically talking about alert focused state. What we're doing now. Yeah, we're in beta now. So, yeah. so right now, if I said, Rob, real quickly, uh, I want you to imagine, uh, uh, let's say you, you play with a pendulum, right? I, I could look around here and find one probably pretty quickly. But let's say you have a, there you go. Well, a factual pendulum that's on a, on a thing. Not, not that kind. <laughs> Let me see, see if I, yeah, right here. Let me just show you and your audience what I'm talking about. Because actually, this is this is how you don't have to pay somebody three hundred dollars to do hypnosis. So this is this is what I'm talking about. A lot of people have played with this, just like they played with Ouija boards, right? Okay, so I'm gonna. If you just hold, you can make a piece of dental floss and a paper clip works for perfectly, right? Okay. So can you see, can you see this whole thing from my finger to the? Yeah, I can see it, but the radio listeners won't. So yeah, okay. So so you can see it. So right now, if I wanted to imagine this going in a circle, and I just, just said, oh, I'm gonna, I want it to go in a circle. Go, I'm imagining it going in a circle. Nothing's happening, right? So that's because just imagination. Einstein said imagination is more powerful than knowledge. But only imagination that's truly believed in to a high degree. So if I really want to believe in this, I can do it this way. I can, or if you did. I would say, Rob, do you know you have idiomotor neurons in your fingertips that when you go out of beta and into alpha brainwave frequency, if you believe in throwing a ball or hitting something, uh, you know, with a baseball or whatever, in, in any movement, that there are idiomotor neurons that start firing relative to that muscle group right away. Edmund Jacobson proved that in 1939. Okay, with EEG machines, right? Watching tennis players, ten, you know, hooking them up when they actually did a serve and then having them lay flat on a table and then asking them to imagine that serve and, 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 and hypnotizing them to really, or asking them to go deeper and deeper to, until they were really imagining it. And all the same muscle groups lit up on the same machine that were that in the reality, right? All right, so now I take this pendulum and now I'm gonna first, I'm gonna move my fingers and hand in a normal way to make it go around. And why am I doing that? So I can visualize what it looks like when it goes in a circle, because that's gonna help me believe in the image better, right? Okay, now that I got that, and I know that this is really credible because we can Google idiomotor neuron uh, uh, work and we can read a lot of good articles about it. So now I'm gonna trust in that and I'm gonna stop thinking in the ways that we're thinking and talking now. I'm gonna inhale, exhale, and begin to imagine it going in a circle. And you're doing that with eyes open. That helps me imagine it better. Looking at it and seeing what happens helps me imagine it better. Some people like to do it with their eyes closed. For me, see it's getting bigger and bigger, bigger and bigger. So I can do that. Now, in essence, and professional hypnotherapists, which I used to be, make a lot of money, won't want to hear this, that I'm saying this. But when somebody sits down with that pendulum work and gets that thing going, they just save themselves the money of a visit to a hypnotherapist if, this is a big if, 
if they know what it is that they really want to change and how to word it. So let's say you're a professional golfer and you just learn a little bit of hypnosis. So you go out on the field, you're in front of a sand trap and you go, aha, I got this skill. And you take out your little pendulum and maybe you move it around. Or maybe you get so good that you don't have to do that anymore. You can imagine a finger moving at your side. Or you know when you're in hypnosis. Well, once you learn how to access these states, access, exactly. then yeah, but you the, have a reflex that you can turn it on. Yeah. Yeah, but once it's on, it's you got to know how to phrase it because words are powerful. And if, if the person says, ah, now he's in the in, in the trance state, he got there, like you say, but he says, I'm not going to hit the ball in the sand trap. Where's it going to go? In the sand trap. Why? Because the words form the image. So he's going to say, aha, he's going to know cognitively he doesn't want to do that, but his words and images are going to be, I'm going to hit the ball into the fairway. So, so there is, you know, this not, but then you have to double task. You have to have a preconceived way of, I want to start treating women in a way that understands how powerful they are. I, I want to start understanding uh, uh, what um, Brave Buffalo says about how, let a man decide upon his favorite animal and make a study of it, learning from its innocent ways, learning to understand the sounds uh, uh, and become one with it. You know, I want to do that with something. So now you get the pendulum going and while it's going, you equally imagine that you're going to start going out and, and, and befriending an ant, right? And make and learning it. And, and if you do that, you know, that's one way to get into a worldview change. And the alpha state, the alpha brainwave is one that's associated with a quiet mind where you're, you're not really focused on anything. So you're getting to that place and then you're plugging in the, this visualization, these, this self-talk. Well, I mean, semantically, you're, are, you are focusing. Focusing is usually what gets you into the quiet mind. You know, and, 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 uh, but, but, but yeah, I mean, meditation is, you know, if you put yourself into a meditative state in any way that you've learned, and then you move into the imagination. You know, they're two sides of the same coin. You know, one is one is just sort of being and allowing whatever comes to you, uh, and and allowing your mind to to rest. The other is has an intentional uh, directive in mind, right? So let's talk a little bit about the cat fawn. You have an interesting story about how you came up with that concept. Why don't you tell us that? Well, so what cat fawn is is concentration activated transformation, which is what we've been talking about. Okay, so word, for, so word for hypnosis, trance-based learning, which is what ceremonies are. Indigenous people knew this. They wanted to be more generous. They wanted to hunt better. They had a ceremony. They go into trance and they had intentionality and visions. Ceremony is, is, is cat. All right. Fawn are four worldview precepts that are thought very differently in dominant versus indigenous. In the indigenous way, once the fight or flight mechanism is taken care of, fear becomes an opportunity to practice a virtue like courage, generosity, patience, humility, honesty, fortitude. Authority in the dominant worldview is usually external. The preacher, the pope, the, 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 the papa, you know, the president. Indigenous authority this is because they, it was a non-hierarchical. Even the kings and queens of, of, of the Hawaiian islands were reverse dominant cultures. Is lived experience, reflection on lived experience with understanding our interconnectedness. Words are sacred vibrations. You don't lie. And nature is not what it is under the dominant worldview, right? So how do you move once cognitive metacognition means thinking about thinking? Once you use fawn and think about, well, why am I having this problem? What am I afraid of? On whose authority do I have the problem? What words do I use when I'm talking about the problem? And are they accurate? And how have I used nature to help me learn more about it? That's all you got to ask is those four questions. And then you go, oh my gosh, it's the worldview that's the problem. How do I get to it? Then you go into trance, imagine some outcomes, do the cat, and then go out and do a proof of it. Go out and do whatever it is that you need to do to prove that it worked because you have to practice and build on it, right? And it came to me where I was, I had a near death experience on the Rio Uric River. 
uh, I was an ex-Marine officer with a chip on my shoulder about Vietnam, and I didn't get the indigenous, uh, and I was uh, on the re trying to be the first to ascend this river. And uh, um, long story short, it rained. It got to be 4,000 cubic feet per second, and the entire river disappeared into an underground hole, hole taking me with it. Um, you can put in cat fawn. No, you can put on YouTube. YouTube, you can put in the shaman's message and you can see the entire story in three 15 minute segments of my photographs and me narrating it. Um, National Geographic wanted it until they saw the pictures, right? <laughs> so, um, but anyway, when we escaped eventually from, uh, from the, the canyon, which is 8,000 feet deep, on the way up, the Rado Murray Simiron people saved our lives. My, my, my friend and a fellow firefighter, uh, David Carr. And, uh, and, and one of them was carrying a dead fawn, baby deer, that he had run down because they're such great runners. And, you know, they run down to the toilet, couldn't run anymore. And he was taking it back to his people to, for dinner. And in a cave that we had to be in when we escaped the river, uh, as the river was rising, a mountain lion called an onsa walked over our sleeping bags while we were on a narrow ledge and showed us the way out. So I had a vision uh, uh, during that week of that cat and that fawn turning into neon lights with the letter C-A-T-F-A-W-N. And over 15 years and going back and getting a doctorate in an indigenous uh, worldview and studying it, I came up with this what, what my biographer, Michael Fisher says in, in The Fearless Engagement of Four Arrows, he calls it a dehypnotizing technology. Cat fawn is a dehypnotizing technology. Specifically aiming at dehypnosis of colonialism, really. Right? Yeah, that's a good way to say it. Yeah, so uh, we need to do another show ID now. And then right. I'd like you to come back and you'll know, give an example of one of the, the quotes from Sitting Bull uh, in the book, okay? And my guest for the show is Wahinkpe Topa also known as Four Arrows, also known as Don Trent Jacobs. He is a former director of education at Oglala Lakota College, currently a professor at Fielding Graduate University. He's the author of 22 books, and his most recent is Sitting Bull's Words for a World in Crisis. Now, in this book, you take a quote from Sitting Bull, and then you tell a story about the context in which the quote appeared. And the, the story is 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 really important to this. So why don't you pick one from the book and tell us about the quote, tell us the story, and then tell us about how you apply cat fawn to it and how that fits into this discussion of the hypnosis of colonialism. Well, sure. Well, I just opened up to uh, chapter two, uh, uh, and it's about uh, moving from a fear-based way of being in the world to a fearlessness-based way. That's the chapter. And the quote from Sitting Bull is, friends, hardships pursue me. Fearless of them, I live. Love of my country is the reason I'm doing this. And the context is just a paragraph. In December of 1876, Tatanka Ayoteke, that's Sitting Bull's name, uh, and his band fled toward the Missouri bottoms after a costly battle with the US Army. Cold and hungry, they came upon a freshly killed buffalo. They were amazed at their luck until they realized that it had been poisoned. Uh, they continued to the Canadian border. During the brutal journey, Sitting Bull composed and sang uh, a song uh, that relates to the fearlessness that was required for them to continue. And then I go on to tell about other stories where he and a colleague sat a certain number of meters, about 100 meters from a train that was stopped with uh, shooters on the back of it. Uh, and uh, they tempted, they were tempting as they smoked a, a, a chanupa, a pipe, they, they tempted these shooters and the shooters shot at them and the bullets landed around them. Uh, and then they got up and, and left, right? Uh, demonstrating 
of fearlessness. Now, the idea of fearlessness in Western philosophy is usually considered foolishness. And then I discuss about, I talk about this idea. Socrates said that it's foolishness, that it's only that courage requires having the fear. Well, he's, he's partially right. In the ind indigenous world, courage is, the, is sort of the father of all of the, of the, uh, of the virtues. Uh, the highest expression of courage is generosity. To give away your most cherished possession for a child to give a, its puppy away to someone who needs it more than they, etc. Right. However, what I've learned in my living with the the, the Seri Indian, the Rabal Murti, the Navajo the groups of people that are the Sun Dancers and the, the, the Lakota Oglala and others, I've learned that they have gone from courage to fearlessness when they take action. So Rob, imagine that you're climbing up a cliff when you come to visit me in British Columbia. I got a great creek and a 30 foot drop off into a waterfall if you wanna go up and jump into the river. Imagine that when you get up there, you know there's no fight or flight because we've checked it out. There's no submerged logs. You know it's deep. You saw me do it a couple of times. So now it's a, you go up there and you stand on the edge of that cliff you're going to feel the fear. You know, it's 30 feet down and that's high and it's natural, right? But let's say you get the courage up to do it. And you say, okay, I'm, I'm going to trust four arrows on this. It looks like it could be really exhilarating. So I'm going to do it. Now you get the courage. Well, that's the courage we need and that indigenous people show when they, you know, they stand against uh, protesting minors, uh, uh, you know, of their, of their land or, or police like it's standing, like I did at Standing Rock for four and four different times. The courage to stand up to the, and speak truth to power, the courage that you have had and, you, and, and, and so much that you've done in your life. That's the courage. Now you jump. And on the way down, you, ah, you know, maybe you close your eyes, you know, ah, and then you hit the water. And then maybe you don't want to do it again. But now imagine that you've learned the, the indigenous way of moving from courage to fearlessness before you did that. So first you got to get that courage up and to climb up the, the rocks, you know, that the bears climb up to get a salmon from the waterfall. Now you climb up that and you get on that top of there. And now you're hearing that waterfall rushing because it's going to, as soon as you hit the water, that water, that waterfall is going to suck you around and push you around. So that's part of the fear. And now you got the courage. You look at it, you know logically that it's going to be relatively safe enough for the enjoyment. But this time, as soon as your feet leave the ledge, you move into fearlessness, which is trusting the universe. Whatever the outcome, you're committed. And now your eyes are open. You see an eagle fly overhead. As you're going down, you see a salmon go past you. You feel the beauty of the air rushing past you. When you plunge, you feel that sensation of going down through the cold water. You feel joy. You want to get up and go do it again, right? There's a reason that activists burn out. You know, uh, I won the Moral Courage Award from the, uh, the Martin Springer Institute for Holocaust Studies when I was at NAU for my activism. And, and, I, and I told people, it's like, when we decide that something is the right thing to do, there can be no hesitation and there can be no, no more fear. We have to trust in that or else we burn out. And, and so uh, this is what this chapter was because Sitting Bull represent, represented that. This now, talk, about, yeah. talk about Cat Fawn and how that plays a role in this. Okay, so let's, well, people are fear-based and everyone's problems are related to some fear. So if people cognitively recognize that with a particular situation, you know, I, 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 I have this fear of my boss or whatever it is, they, they recognize that with fear that, ah, I got to now practice a virtue. So I got to go practice now. I got to face that fear by using generosity. Like a, a bear comes up in front of me on a trail, right? And I can't run. I can't fight. So I go, ah, what, what virtue have I been practicing on? Generosity, patience, honesty, fortitude, courage. I can say, yeah, I've been practicing generosity. 
And so sincerely, I will say to the bear, if you and your, and your cubs need my body more than I need these berries for my children, I give myself to you. And you do it sincerely. Well, the bear never been treated that way before it lets you go, right? So that so you do that with, 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 and you say, okay, so what am I afraid of? And then you go to, on whose authority do I have the fear? And you go, well, it's because that's something that the church taught me or my dad taught me or a teacher taught me. And then you look to see if is it really true still? Or is that just an isolated incident? You know? So then you went, well, yeah, I guess I shouldn't be afraid of bathtub water because I had a near drowning 10, 20 years ago in an ocean. Okay. And I did this. I was a clinical therapist. That's, that's what happens. People don't go into a bathtub because they had a near death experience in an ocean when they were five years old. We go on then to, on, okay, what words do I say? A lady wants to lose weight. And I say, what do you say when you look in the mirror? She says, I see a fat person. I said, words have to be accurate. That's not accurate. You have to be in a jar to be a, to be a, to be fat, right? And then she will eventually get to the point, ah, I am a beautiful woman who happens to have more adipose tissue on me than I want for health. Exactly, right? So we get the words, we get the, 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 the fear concern, and we get the authority. And then if I've gone out into nature and pondered my problem with my boss or whatever it is, and by looking at the ants or looking at the birds or looking at the clouds, what do I get from that? With that cognitive understanding, now you go into cat with a solution. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to go to my boss and without anger, I'm going to walk in and say, you were wrong about such and such, right? And now you visualize that and you do that in a way that uh, you know you're in, in, in beta. And then tomorrow morning, alpha. bingo, there you, you are. Said, you said beta, you meant alpha, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But that's, that's the, you know, in a nutshell, you know, uh, I mean, your folks, your folks on this, in this presentation are getting an eight week course in less than 90 minutes. So I don't think I've ever presented this so, so uh, thoroughly in such a short time. I hope it, I hope people will. Well, to kind of summarize it from what I read and what you said, you, you're going to look at a situation where you've, you're programmed in a way that comes from authority that gives you fear that basically you become aware of it and then you go into a self-hypnotic state and you come up with a language that you need to use to reframe it in a, in a healthy way and visualize it and uh, that's going to help to turn you around so you let go of the old way and enter the new way of thinking. Beautifully articulated my friend and you know so it's it's not it's not earth shaking to do this. We should be doing this. You know, we and indigenous people have done this all their lives without knowing about hypnosis. You know, like I say, with ceremony and with understanding nature. So that's what we got to do. And uh, now there is one of my former students, uh, David Levine. He dropped out of the doctoral program to become an entrepreneur and won some awards as an entrepreneur. But he was so motivated by Cat Fong. He did a. He, he's a Jewish New York guy. And uh, he actually went to the Lakota uh, and became a sun dancer and did his four sun dance files. Well, now he has created, if you go to catfawn.com, he's created a school that I, I did the first eight week courses, eight uh, of, of, nine, of 90 minute courses for him. And he's recorded those. And now he's gonna try to, he's gonna try to wake up the world, he says. You know, I mean, I don't know if he's gonna have success with it or not, but, but he's a brilliant guy. and. Uh, and we did the eight weeks just recently, and now he's off on his own as an entrepreneur of the catfawn.com program. So hopefully, he, uh, maybe he'll quote you because you said it so uh, succinctly. <laughs> but in the book, you go through each of these different examples of, of, of the angle, different perspectives of the worldview, and you the precepts. And you get into detail on, on how to look at the cat fawn ideas, how to look at your fear, how to look at your languaging and your visual imaging, and how to turn it around with self hypnosis. You go into a lot of detail. Uh, as to make well, we did that detail. We had uh, 17 people in, in, the, in the first uh, cat fawn certification program. And uh, uh, I've gotten letters from nine of them 
that have said that it's turned the world totally around, that it's just absolutely transformed, transformed them. But over the years, uh, I wrote the first book on cat fawn and primal awareness uh, in, uh, back in 1998, Inner Traditions International published it. Uh, and it was my doctoral dissertation at Boise State University. Um, and over those years, there were cat fawn uh, groups that were uh, all over the, uh, the, you know, the world that were contacting me. Uh, and um, so, you know, there's, 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 there's some evidence that it works uh, besides the, you know, the vision. And of course, in indigenous ways, visions are a source of, of knowledge, just like research. And, you know, you, I got to add that it, it sounds really simple and it is really simple, but to make it work, it takes a lot of work and it yeah. takes a lot of focus and intention, I think, is a really important part of it. I agree 100%. Yeah. We've got to wrap. Any final words? Right. No, just that, you know, I've used this for two spontaneous remissions of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma cancer. I just had my second one and I fell off the wagon by going back into, uh, you know, a lifestyle that was a little more stressful than it should have been. But, um, you know, so it's powerful stuff. And I really hope that, that, uh, that people really start thinking about worldview and more importantly, supporting the people that still hold on to this these, this, and, and the more important place-based knowledge that comes from the language. So we can't do this independent of not supporting uh, indigenous people around the world. All right. Bob, bye-bye. Thank you. My guest for this show has been Wahinkpe Topa, AKA Four Arrows, AKA Don Trent Jacobs, who is the author of 22 books. And his most recent is Sitting Bull's Words for a World in Crisis. And you can find out more about him at fourarrowsbooks.com. Thanks, man. Okay, watch you on Facebook.